Welcome back. Europe's four worst hit countries reported declines in the pace of the coronavirus and coronavirus deaths. And an Italian health official said his country's outbreak may be cresting. Markets co-anchor Rishad Salamat has the latest developments. Rish. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is Italy, which have been Spain, France and the UK all having a lower death toll than they have done in uh, weeks. In the case of Italy, uh, the lowest single-day uh, coronavirus deaths in two and a half weeks. It's perhaps uh, an early sign, at least, that this is the hope, that weeks of strict confinement measures to contain this outbreak are finally starting to bear fruit. Now, Italy does, of course, remain on strict lockdown. We've got Lombardy. This is the hardest hit region. And uh, now it's got, to, over the weekend, new restrictions coming in requiring that citizens who leave their homes shield their mouths and noses with masks or other coverings. And they're insisting the residents remain inside for all but essential tasks. Uh, now, police have been fining people. 175,000 people have been signed since the 11th of March for violations of the lockdown. And the country is preparing now for a fifth week of lockdown measures. And at the same time, while we have arguably uh, a cresting in, uh, in, in the number of people being infected, a, a, a cresting of those, uh, the opposition leader, according to reports, uh, Matteo Salvini, has uh, called on the government uh, of the Prime Minister, Giuseppe Conte, to open churches for the coming Easter holiday. Uh, the fact that churches were open for about three weeks uh, as this coronavirus took hold has been actually been blamed for how it spread there as well. Spain has now become the biggest uh, epicenter of uh, the coronavirus in Europe, surpassing that uh, of Italy. Uh, Pedro Sanchez, the uh, uh, prime minister, is planning to extend the country's lockdown until the uh, 25th of April. Uh, at the same time, in France, the total number of fatalities rising to 7,560. Uh, the UK did actually, though, report its deadliest day yet with an increase of 708 deaths. The virus is crippling Europe at a time when most countries now are in some form of lockdown. Uh, we've got, at the same time, how do these entire economies, which are heading into a deep recession, something a depression, find ways to mitigate the damage? This is the perplexing question. Uh, we've got Spain, Italy and France calling for so-called corona bonds is something that the Germans and the Dutch are dead against. Uh, at the same time, they're suggesting that the European stability mechanism will offer them the possibility to get money to uh, bolster their, their coffers, as it were, as well. Something that Italy, Spain and France have actually rejected here. Uh, back to you guys. Arish, take us through what's happening in India. It seems like the country now is banning exports uh, of a drug that President Trump has touted as saying it could be a game changer in this coronavirus fight. Well, well I'm not sure I can pronounce it. It's called hydrochloroquine. It's a malaria drug. Donald Trump has been repeatedly touting as a game changer in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, just to say that the U.S. Surgeon General uh, Jerome Adams on Sunday did say that there have been some accounts, some stories about this treatment helping and don't forget that this drug has been available for years here as well. So exports of this uh, drug and its formulations are being prohibited now, and quote, without any exceptions with immediate effect. Uh, that's what uh, the India's Director General of Foreign Trade said uh, on its website. The trade regulator has last month restricted overseas shipments of the drug, now banning them entirely here as well. Uh, at a press conference Saturday, uh, Donald Trump did speak to Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and appealed for the release of shipments and uh, India said it was giving his request serious consideration. Uh, consideration. Well, this uh, ban came about just uh, shortly after uh, that statement was made here. Uh, but it's really a, a, a situation in India. We've got the one-tenth of uh, the uh, number of cases there in Mumbai. There's uh, over 3,370 of them at the moment. And one thing which is really a concern is uh, the, the number of slums that there are in India, like the one in, uh, in Mumbai itself. Dharavi is just about uh, three miles away from uh, Mumbai's key business district and home, of course, to India's biggest stock exchange, the financial capital of the country. Uh, the thing is, we've got about a million people that all crammed together. Now, many of these are migrant neighbors from villages thousands of miles away or hundreds of miles away and keeping that contagion from spreading from a slum like that uh, could actually help prevent hospitals in Mumbai and across India from being overwhelmed. Guys. Rish, thank you, Rish, Rishad Salamat there joining us on the phone, our Markets co-anchor. we got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg.
in San Francisco, a lot of tech action today. Our top stories this morning in D.C. and Boston. The Dow and the S&P. Shall we? So the euro on a seven-day winning streak. The moves in the currency market is just down half and We begin in the oil patch. Saudi Arabia. Brent crude oil. pretty much unchanged. Welcome to Bloomberg, the first word Asia. We the U.S. and Japan duke it out over exchange. China's slumping onshore bond market is great. I hope that banks will follow, and we have seen other banks following uh, the ECB recommendation this morning. This had unique credit. I think it's important for banks to be here to support the economy. Banks are part of the solution. Welcome back. 3M is pushing back against a request from the Trump administration to halt exports of protected face masks. CEO Mike Roman told Bloomberg the move would cut off critical supplies for neighboring countries. We continue to do everything we can to fight COVID-19 and support healthcare workers here at home. We're, we've ramped up our production in the U.S. as quickly as possible. We saw this early in January and, and ramped up production capacity that we keep idle for just these kinds of situations. So we are we are working to expand that. We're focused on delivering as much as we can in April. And the narrative overnight that we're not doing everything to maximize the delivery of respirators in our home country is false. It, nothing could be further from the truth. And and the idea that 3M is not doing all it can to fight price gouging and unauthorized reselling is absurd. And I, we have been at the front lines of, of really leading this as we've gone through it. So I, that narrative is, you know, for all the framers that have dedicated so much time and effort to, to really lead the fight here, uh, it was disappointing to hear that narrative overnight. It's always uh, hard to know exactly what the White House is talking about, uh, but in this case, it seems that the president heard a report that you are selling some of these masks to Canada and into Latin America, which, uh, as I understand it, has been a common business practice for you. Yeah, we have, under normal circumstances, we produce about 19 million respirators, 20 million respirators a month in the U.S. 90% of that goes to industrial customers, and a portion of that goes to Canada and Latin America to serve customers there. In a crisis like this, we double that output, and we shift to 90% plus to healthcare, only supporting key industries like pharmaceutical manufacturing or food uh, production. And so we continue to support Canada and Latin America. It's part of our strategy. We have excess capacity to bring online. This COVID fight is like nothing we've seen. It, the demand is so much greater. So we are trying to do everything we can to bring capacity into the U.S. while we still serve Canada and Latin America, where we are often the sole supplier of healthcare workers in those countries. So we have expanded our capacity. We'll ramp up another 5 million respirators in the month of April. We now have just uh, got agreement to be able to export 10 million N95 respirators from our China manufacturing into the U.S. And so we are stepping up and we are bringing more production online in June. So we'll get up to 50 million plus what we can bring from China. So we're a, a net importer into the U.S., even though we continue to serve, serve Canada and Latin America with a small amount of that production. It's less than 10 percent of our normal production. And so it's it is. Uh, it, it becomes a humanitarian issue that we have to try to balance, and, and we are at the same time maximizing everything we can bring to U.S. healthcare workers. Mike, is there price gouging of some of these masks? How far down the supply chain through the customer, really, are you able to control prices? Yeah, and, and on price gouging, it's, it's good to be clear here. We are manufacturing respirators. We sell those to distributors, and in in the healthcare crisis, we sell through half a dozen large, reputable distributors, and we have a strong partnership. We work with them to get product where it's needed. Your Senator Peters' comment about triage, that's exactly what we're doing. We're triaging to serve the most critical need, working with FEMA to ship directly, but also working with our distributors to get there. Prior to COVID outbreak, we were selling to 90% to industrial distributors, and they're selling to a broad range of customers. Some of that inventory has ended up in resellers, and those resellers are where this unethical, despicable behavior of, of price gouging is taking place. 3M, we have not and would never increase prices for our respirators during this crisis, and we don't sell to the highest bidder. We sell through 
these authorized distributors or directly to the government. And it's, it's beyond that that we go with uh, DOJ and state AGs to really pursue these perpetrators. We, we bring our data online. We help with counterfeits. We authenticate 3M products. We work with e-tailers to make sure we're calling out those price gouging and uh, resellers. So it's, we're doing everything we can to help law enforcement take that on. And we have a supply chain that ensures in this crisis, and we monitor this every day, it, it is really a strong way to, an effective way to get the product to the customers. So that it's just, dis, it's, it's disappointing and unfortunate that resellers are out there taking advantage of, of this situation the way they are. And that was the 3M CEO, Mike Roman, speaking to Bloomberg. Let's do a market check uh, to see how things are going here. We're still kind of edging higher. This melt-up in equities continues on here in the Asian session. You see U.S. futures continuing to head higher as well. So the likes of the Kospi, I've seen gains here. Samsung really helping this stock here ahead of its earnings that come out tomorrow. It could be uh, give us some glimmer of hints on what how the tech sector has really been dealing with this coronavirus. And you take a look at the likes of Manila. We're up more than 1% of the Philippines. Philippines may extend that lockdown for another two weeks or so, and we're expecting it out of Japan as well. The Tokyo governor, Koike, is expected to speak to press this afternoon. That's according to Kyoto there, but you are seeing a decent session here on this shortened holiday week, Tom. Yeah, and we have an exclusive interview with Nestle CEO coming up later as well. That's at 7.10 p.m. Sydney, 4.10 p.m. Hong Kong time. Don't miss it. This is... Commodity investing is more than buying gold and oil. From coffee and corn to cattle and natural gas, many sectors drive the commodity markets. And the Bloomberg Commodity Index covers them all. With exposure across 23 traded commodities, Bloomberg is the standard for diversification in commodity markets. With full transparency, measure and monitor your investment performance against the benchmark used by commodity professionals globally. More than gold and oil. The Bloomberg Commodity Index. Yet another day of risk off across the financial markets. We bring you special coverage of all the price action and implications here on Bloomberg Television.
It's almost 11 o'clock in Singapore, 8.30 a.m. in Mumbai. I'm Haslinda Amin. And I'm Yvonne Man. We are entering the last hour of the morning session here in Hong Kong. Here are the top stories. Japan is reported to be about to declare a state of emergency and new stimulus measures as virus cases soar. Recession may be looming for Tokyo itself. The pandemic has throttled demand for energy and stoked rivalry among top oil producers. OPEC delays emergency talks as Saudi Arabia and Russia blame each other for the price crash. And the alleged sales fraud at Luckin Coffee raises new questions about probability in Chinese commerce. We're joined this hour by the Asian Corporate Governance Association. This is Uber Markets Asia. Well, let's take a look at where the markets are right now. Asian stocks mostly higher. We have a Japan, Australia, Korea, Vietnam, all firmly in the money. There's optimism. We're seeing some stability in the fight against the virus, even though global virus cases have surpassed 1.2 million. Fewer fatalities reported in the likes of New York, Italy, Spain. The market's brushing off the horrendous U.S. non-farm payroll number out Friday. Now, as far as uh, the Nikkei is concerned, boosted pretty much by gains in KDDI and Danka. Telecom and pharma stocks among the biggest gainers on the topics. Japan Governor Koike due to speak later today. Japan, though, bracing for that state of emergency, which could be called as early as tomorrow. The Yomuri reporting that Tokyo will be affected, along with Osaka Prefecture and Hyogo Free Prefecture as well. Taking a look at where the STI is right now, currently up by about 2%, lifted pretty much by a positive sentiment. We're keeping a watch on that third stimulus package to be announced later this afternoon by the finance minister. Uh, that's adding to the fiscal stimulus amounting to 11% of GDP. Singapore, of course, grappling with that virus spread. It reported the most number of new cases overnight. Non-essential workers, by the way, will operate from home from tomorrow. Schools will be shut from Wednesday. Let's flip the page, take a look at where we are in terms of currencies, the dollar crunch pretty much easing. The dollar has given up some gains, but remains relatively strong. Some reprieve for EM currencies, though we're keeping a track on the rupiah, still inching ever closer to 17,000. That's the lowest level on record. Will be interesting to see the FX reserves when several banks, including Indonesia, Philippines, and Malaysia, reveal their FX reserves later this week. We'll see how much they've boosted their currencies, how much is left in their coffers to continue to boost those currencies. Vaughn. Yeah, but what seems to be supporting this rally here today is what we're seeing in U.S. futures, which are pointing positive uh, north of 3 percent right now. Uh, the, the talk that President Trump had the press briefing earlier this morning saying we see light at the end of the tunnel, a little bit more optimistic than his warnings about a horrendous period ahead. You also have uh, a peak in cases in Europe as well, certain countries like Italy, like France, like Spain. Uh, the U.K. is still a bit of a problem spot, though. You do have the, the U.K. Prime Minister Boris Johnson admitted to a hospital after showing persistent coronavirus symptoms and you're seeing a bit of a pressure on the pound here today at 122.36. Healthcare, though, one of the biggest sectors to outperform today. You see and hear more news, the likes of Fujifilm Holdings uh, after the government plans to give Avigan one of their drugs to other countries. Bioletics as well has a COVID-19 rapid test kit that gets approval for sale in the EU. So more news of perhaps a antiviral coming into play. The Hang Seng, we're still up about 200 points right now. China is closed. Keep in mind Macau, India and Thailand and also closed for holidays, Easter holidays on Friday as well. So it is a shortened week when it comes to trading. But Hong Kong, of course, we just heard from the finance secretary, Paul Chan, saying it's going to take at least six weeks, six months, I should say, for a reversal in this economic impact from this pandemic. So uh, we'll see how that plays out, of course. Uh, still talks that those cash handouts in Hong Kong could be delayed. Let's take a look at the surge in coronavirus cases in Tokyo now over the weekend. May prompt Japanese leaders to alter course and declare a national state of emergency. Local media says Prime Minister Shinzo Abe may announce the move as early as Tuesday. Let's get to our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. He's been watching all the developments coming through Japan. Steve, what does this mean for Japan? Well, two major developments coming out of Japan today. There could be more uh, lockdowns coming and there could also be more handouts coming first of all on the lockdowns well we're going to be hearing from the yomiuri newspaper as well as kyoto news service uh, that a national emergency declaration could come as early as tomorrow the announcement could be made tomorrow and the imposing on wednesday now that would allow or give the national government a permission to 
local prefectural and municipal governments uh, to impose lockdowns if they so desire. Now, uh, the re media reports are indicating Tokyo and the surrounding areas, possibly Saitama, Chiba, and Kanagawa would be one lockdown, possibly as well as Osaka, as well as Hyogo prefectures. We're hearing as well from Kyoto, it could be Hokkaido, which had a local lockdown earlier in February, which was lifted. But now we're just waiting to hear from Shinzo Abe uh, to possibly make an announcement as early as today or tomorrow. We're also hearing that uh, the governor of Tokyo, uh, Yuriko Koike, will be speaking to the media sometime this afternoon. There will also be a coronavirus task force uh, convened meeting uh, convened later today. So, so much is going on. Of course, now that the Olympics have been postponed by a year, uh, Japanese taking it uh, quite seriously, uh, despite the economic pain that they've been feeling. Uh, this uh, Tokyo area is the 11th biggest economy in the world and one-third of Japan's GDP. So that's why they are throwing lots of money. We're getting a second major stimulus package uh, to be likely released or announced soon. It could be released in a couple of phases. First phase would be emergency measures to prevent job losses. Second phase would be once the epidemic is contained, uh, more stimulus to support a V-shaped recovery in Japan, which of course had that fourth quarter GDP sink 7.1 percent. Fourth quarter, that was before the coronavirus. So, uh, you know, J Japanese economy is in serious trouble, but now they're worried about more cases of the coronavirus making things even worse. Uh, Steve, President Trump talks about stabilization. In fact, the markets are rising on that. But we've seen increased cases in the likes of Singapore, in Hong Kong. What's, what's planned there? Yeah, I mean, we're having a second uh, wave of infections in both places. In uh, Singapore, uh, they've seen an additional 195 cases over the weekend, a rise of 18 uh, percent from Friday. Uh, they have 1,309 cases, six deaths. They've announced that all businesses will be shut down. You have to work from home as of tomorrow. Schools will be closed from Wednesday. They're about to unveil possibly as early as today when the finance minister speaks in parliament at 2 p.m. to unveil a third stimulus package, a third in less than two months, I might add. So Singapore obviously taking this quite seriously. Hong Kong, we're hearing from uh, Carrie Lam's chief advisor, executive council, convener Bernard Chan, saying a stricter lockdown could be possible or warranted. 28 new cases on Sunday. They now have 890 here in Hong Kong, four deaths. Now, those stricter lockdown measures could include a closing of all non-essential businesses and confining people to home. Right now, worldwide confirmed cases, 1,272,115 in the United States, 337,000. That means, as Linda, that is one in every 1,000 people in America have been infected. Wow. Steve, thank you. Stephen Engel, our Chief North Asia Correspondent, joining us from Hong Kong. Let's get to the first word news. Karina Mitchell is in New York. Karina. Hey, Yvonne. Here in the U.S., President Trump is sounding a more upbeat note on the coronavirus, dropping his warning of horrendous times to come for America and saying he's seeing infections start to level off. Vice President Mike Pence agrees, saying the administration is beginning to see a glimmer of progress. New York State reported a lower rate of deaths on Sunday, prompting optimism at the White House. New York, the first time where the deaths were less from the previous day, that's the first drop so far, so maybe that's a good sign. It could be. We hope we're seeing a leveling off in the hottest spots of them all. The World Health Organization says face masks may not be protection against the coronavirus. Executive Director Mike Ryan told a daily briefing that wearing a mask in public may not prevent the catching of COVID-19, but can help stop an infected person passing it on. Johns Hopkins University says worldwide infection cases have topped 1.2 million, with deaths approaching 70,000. India has banned all exports of a malaria drug touted by President Trump as a cure for COVID-19. The government says shipments of hydroxychloroquine are prohibited without exception and with immediate effect. Last month, India restricted shipments of the drug to existing orders. Trump has described hydroxychloroquine as a game changer, although medical experts are less certain. And police in New South Wales, including homicide detectives, are launching a criminal investigation into how a cruise ship carrying passengers with reported virus symptoms 
was able to disembark people in Sydney. The incident happened last month and 10 of the passengers have since died of COVID-19. About 2,700 people were allowed to leave the vessel, which is operated by Carnival Australia. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Karina Mitchell. This is Bloomberg. Yvonne. Still ahead this hour, trouble is brewing for executives at Luck and Coffee as the Chinese rival to Starbucks issues a public apology for alleged fraud. We speak to a corporate governance expert later on in the show. But up next, investor advisor, investment advisor Paul Gamble says it's hard to see how monetary policy can do anything but spook the markets. The MBMG Group managing partner is next. This is Bloomberg. All right, markets are seeing a pretty risk on session here today. Our next guest, though, believes a medium to long term outlook for markets boils down to the ultimate structural efficiency of stimulus. Let's bring in Paul Gamble's co founder and managing partner of MBMG Group. He joins us on the line from Bangkok. Paul, always great to have you. Uh, I was just reading a couple of days ago that you were saying cash is still the biggest holding across many of your portfolios for the first time since the global financial crisis. H has anything happened in the last week? to alter that kind of allocation? Um, I, I think, if anything, we, we've probably slightly increased the uh, the amount of cash holding in portfolios over the last week or so, partly because we've been... Uh, We've been cashing in uh, traditional treasury holdings, and we've been uh, we've been replacing those with uh, with uh, long-term zeros instead, which are uh, which are much more sensitive. So uh, you, you actually need a smaller holding of those to get the, the same impact. Uh, so if anything, cash has gone up. But you know, we take the view that uh, cash is a kind. Uh, then actually you should be holding cash. And so cash is now typically probably 20% of a lot of the portfolios we've got, 25 in some cases. So that's a, that's a pretty extreme level for us. Yes, but I mean, we, we've seen, at least when it comes to the dollar funding stress, that seems to be easing up a bit now. Vol volatility has come down a bit. And you're seeing some of the cheapest valuations that we've seen in, in years. Is, is there a sense that perhaps you're missing out on some bargains now? I, I don't think so because I don't think we can know for sure that the bargains. I mean, you know, we, we've still got our uh, toes dipped in the equity waters, but very, very uh, carefully, very selectively, much more sort of, you know, selective in terms of strategy. So, 
you know, long short is, is, a, is a great way to play equities right now. Um, we, we use some uh, quantitative AI-driven methodologies that, uh, that, that, that use market signals to, to buy stocks or, or cover stocks. Uh, but actually, you know, going out right long, it's it's a coin flip still at this time. You know, we're, we're, we're having a, a good day in the markets so far today. But again, it's interesting, even across Asia, you know, there's a big, big difference between sort of almost 3% up in, in, in Tokyo and in Sydney versus... Um, this is just over half a percent up in Hong Kong, so and, and Singapore somewhere in the middle. So and, and obviously we've had Bangkok banks, uh, all of it, the main uh, bank in Thailand downgraded uh, uh, today. So uh, it, it's, it's still an incredibly unclear picture out there, and it's still completely hostage to, uh, to to news flow in the short term. So you know, short term, frankly, it's it's a coin flip, and I don't think you're getting the uh, the right odds on a coin flip even at this pricing. So. You've got to kind of watch that news flow because if we get good, solid, consistent news flow about uh, about the virus, then maybe that's an argument in the short term. But you've still got these long-term structural problems to face as well. So it's uh, it's it's not the absolute bargain that the, the people are, are saying it is. It's still a very nuanced. You know, it's 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 a coin flip. It can go either way. That's right to your point, Paul. I mean, the S and P is up 15 percent from its lows and you say that we could see a possible 40 side 40 percent downside from here even though that is not your base case scenario what will take us there what will be the catalyst in, in the short term it's purely all about news flow it's, it's all about corona it's all about uh whether we get you know uh, upbeat or, or downbeat news coming out of the white house about it um it's it, it's really hostage entirely to, to news flow in the in the short term um, and, and you know you have to remember we're, we're up uh, from those lows but uh, but we're actually about six percent off the, uh, the the sort of interim peak that we had just last tuesday so even in the space of a week you know the volatility that we're getting is so extreme and it's so day-to-day -day. you know we, we send out that quote that lenin quote that uh, there are decades when nothing happens and, and weeks when decades happen well every single day there are months happening in the market and and for people to try and you know to, to guess what that is which is it's essentially if you're buying at this level you're guessing that things are okay that this is somewhere near a bottom that there are going to be higher levels in future um, then, you know, thank you, that, that, that is just a guess. And, and I don't think it's responsible to be going out there guessing with people's money. So you've got to have, you know, something much more robust as a strategy. And our strategy is to, is to wait until we've got clarity. And, you know, this, this bounce isn't clarity. This could very easily be a bear market bounce. What do you make of balance sheet risks in Asia? How big a concern is that for you? I, I, I think I think we're looking at all kinds of risk globally right now. I think we're looking at um, you know we're looking at the uh, the balance sheet risk not just in Asia but uh, but but everywhere. The the one aspect of that is, 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 is that we've seen is dividend cuts. Um, so you know you, you saw what happened with HSBC and Standard Chartered. That's a huge risk that's out there right now. Uh, I think uh, the, the credit risk is, is another huge risk. Uh, that's more of a risk, a risk in the States where the credit market is so extreme. Um, I think, you know, in China, what we've seen, the latest reactions with, uh, with, with uh, you know, the RRR action and also the uh, in interest on excess reserves, that's trying to force money into the economy. I think, if anything, what we see is Asia is maybe slightly ahead of the curve in that the policy responses have actually been more proactive at getting money to businesses. And I think the balance sheets in a lot of Asian countries were probably in a better state than a lot of the balance sheets in the West going into this. So balance sheet risk is a, it's, it's one of many, many risks out there. But for us, it's a bigger risk in the States than it is in Asia, and it's a much bigger risk in Europe than it is in the States. And, and Paul, you've also mentioned that the cost of hedging is getting more expensive now. How does that change your view on gold and the likes of yeah. treasuries? What's the playbook now? Yeah, so that's, that's a great call. Um, so we, we've, uh, you know, we've done really well this year because we've been so biased towards long treasuries. We've been biased towards gold. Um, that has changed. It's very difficult to see, you know, the upside in treasuries anymore, um, simply because of, of where rates are. And it's also hard to see as much upside in gold. So we've done a couple of things. One is um, with uh, with gold, we've rotated out of gold and into uh, into gold miners. In terms of treasuries, I say that's interesting. We're, we're sort of, um, I guess, you'd say we're having a mid-crisis life, and uh, you know, the day we've, uh, we've we've given up our sort of long-term passive faithful partner, which was. Uh, 
which was uh, Treasury's ETF. And uh, we've, we've sort of taken up with a stripper from South California, you could say, in that we're uh, we're using Kimco's uh, zeros, <laughs> which these strips they, they strip out the uh, they strip out the coupons, and that makes a much much more sensitive uh, play on Treasury. So um, uh, we're we're still trying to find those anti-fragile assets, but they're getting harder, and you've got to be more creative to get that anti-fragility into the portfolio. Paul, always great to have you. Paul Gambles there, co-founder and managing partner of MVMG Group, joining us on the line from Bangkok. I just want to mark these lines coming through from Indonesia. The Jakarta composite here on fire, rising 20% since March of 24th, and it now has entered a bull market. So in just a matter of two weeks, it's been able to recover uh, some of the losses that we've seen, of course, but seriously, we're not close to the peaks that we saw at the start of the year when it comes to Indonesia. But there was some news that we learned uh, just a couple dates ago, the minister saying Indonesia ready to add $25 billion of stimulus, and they're beefing up the central bank's powers to handle the crisis as well. But yes, you do see quite a comeback there. Uh, but J Jakarta coming back and entering a bull market. Coming up, delayed OPEC Plus talks raise doubts about the prospects of a price deal. After fresh divisions emerge, we'll look at what's behind oil's renewed slump next. This is Bloomberg. Even in a circumstance where you're down 80% of the rest of the year, we're still going to have $4 billion of cash. Uh, we're going to have access to a $2 billion revolver. We think it's highly, highly, highly unlikely, but we are planning for the worst case. Welcome back. Brent crude has paid some of its losses after plunging 12% at the open in Asia. Futures fell after a virtual meeting of OPEC Plus was postponed as Saudi Arabia and Russia traded bobs while also attempting to get the U.S. involved in production curbs. Let's bring in oil reporter Sharon Cho from the Lion City. Sharon, let's start with the OPEC Plus meeting and its impact on prices. Hi, Aslinda. Yeah, the oil prices have been really volatile um, since last week and it's, gave, it's lost some of its declines earlier from earlier today but it's still down and it's because the OPEC plus meeting which was scheduled to be taking place today was now like deferred and tentatively scheduled for Thursday and it comes as Saudi Arabia and Russia want the US to join in but Trump President Trump hasn't given any response on it yet and also Saudi Arabia made a pointed diplomatic attack on the Russian president that jeopardized the deal to slash production. So the Saudi foreign minister, uh, Prince, said that 
Russian president has been laying the blame on Saudi Arabia for the end of OPEC Plus Pact in early March and that it was fully devoid of the truth. So now the so-called oil diplomats are working to bring together a meeting of G20 energy ministers this Friday to bring the U.S. into the negotiations. And this comes amid um, International Energy Agency, which represents nations that consume oil. It, they're also calling for action, saying that there's a huge oversupply in the oil market, which is estimated to be 35 million barrels a day. Uh, Sharon, after OPEC's meeting was postponed, Saudi Arabia, rather Saudi Aramco, said it's delaying the announcement of its prices to customers. How significant is that? Right. So Saudi Aramco is the biggest oil exporter in the world. And they usually announce their official selling prices to their oil customers um, by the 5th of the month. So they did announce after the delay of the OPEC Plus meeting that it will defer um, its release to later this week. And prices are expected to come sometime on Thursday. The release of official selling prices from Saudi Arabia is very important to the market because most of the Middle Eastern producers will follow suit and also set prices in line with Saudi Arabia's pricing. And this month will be a very difficult month for Aramco. They're setting the prices for May. And it's because the global and domestic demand has been totally wiped out because of the spread of the coronavirus. So some of their customers are now waiting to see how much oil they would attempt to buy in their long-term contracts, depending on the Aramco's pricing. So there's a lot of wait and see. Yeah, if they're ready to escalate this price war even further. Mm -hmm. Sharon Cho, thanks. Our oil reporter joining us from Singapore. Just take a look at your GMM function here. And yeah, you do see a bit of a risk rally here today. But we did speak with Paul Gamble saying this could be just a bear market rally. But speaking of the opposite of bear markets, JCI, the Jakarta Composite, just entering that bull market after rising 20% from the lows that we saw just two weeks ago. So it just goes to show how quickly things have turned around. But the one thing that's not really taken part in this in this melt up today is really the EM currencies. You still continue to see dollar strength and the likes of Malaysia ringgit and rupiah seeing some a bit of a weakening bias there. Plenty more to come. This is Bloomberg. another day of risk off across the financial markets we bring you special coverage of all the price action and implications here on Bloomberg television fuel corn livestock precious metals commodities are everywhere and so is Bloomberg Bloomberg commodity indices deliver leading benchmarks for true diversification adding commodity exposure can help hedge against inflation and diversify your stock and bond portfolios with full data transparency and broad distribution, the Bloomberg suite of commodity indices is your measure for the commodity markets. With Bloomberg, you've got the markets covered. The opportunity, uh, we were able to give a big push uh, to develop our catering business. Uh, so that is, uh, that is something that we think uh, we'll continue to work on.
You're looking at live pictures of the Lion City. Quite a gloomy day today, 11.30 a.m. in Singapore. We're in the middle of the trading day. The SGI currently up about 2%, adding to gains. Singapore retail investors using cheap money to load up on stocks, by the way. The MAS, the de facto central bank, says individuals pumped in two billion sing dollars into the stock market in March, which is a 50% increase than in February. Record low interest rates tempting people to load up on debt to buy shares. The STI up about 2%. For now, let's get the first one headlines with Karina Mitchell in New York. Karina. Hey, as Linda, reports from Japan say the government there may declare a state of national emergency as virus cases jump. And a document seen by Bloomberg outlines a new two-state stimulus, including tax concessions and higher subsidies for businesses. Households suffering income losses would receive around $2,750 U.S. dollars in cash, with an extra $90 for each child. Yumi Uri says the announcement may come on Tuesday. Europe's countries worst hit by the coronavirus have reported death rates falling, with Italy saying the worst may be over. Latest figures suggest tight restrictions on public movement are having a positive effect. Between them, Italy and Spain have the most infections in Europe, but the Public Health Institute in Rome says it's seeing a significant slowdown in the spread. Meanwhile, the UK government is threatening even tighter virus restrictions amid signs people are ignoring the rules there. Fine weather over the weekend sent thousands to beauty spots and local parks in defiance of police warnings. Health Secretary Matt Hancock says the government will not hesitate to ban all outdoor activity if people continue to flout the rules. Staying in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is in hospital for coronavirus tests after suffering the effects and remaining in self-isolation for 10 days. Downing Street says it's just a precaution and he remains in charge of the government. Johnson's pregnant partner is also showing symptoms but has yet to be tested. The UK has seen its deadliest day yet with more than 700 new fatalities, taking the total above 4,300. And economies around the world are reeling from the fallout of the coronavirus with businesses closing and unemployment soaring. And Hong Kong says the recovery could take at least six months. Financial Secretary Paul Chan says the government will continue to offer financial help with the effect of spreading from tourism and retail to virtually all industries in the city. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Karina Mitchell. This is Bloomberg. Karina, thank you so much for that. Let's take a look at where the markets are right now. It is risk on pretty much uh, across Asia, China and holiday, along with India and Thailand. Let's take a look at where the Hang Seng Index is right now. Higher, but all of its highs. China Mobile, China Unicom, HSBC driving gains. Brace for sentiment to be hit, though. Hong Kong may be looking at more stringent measures to control the virus. Also, we heard from Finance Chief Paul Chan saying he expects the economic turnaround to take about six months already. That's been a setback. We have the cash handout for residents. Uh, well, that won't be, uh, won't be arriving till maybe the third quarter at the earliest. Taking a look at where the Cosby is right now, up about 2.5%. Samsung Electronics among the biggest gainers is reopening its plants in Slovakia and Hungary. Flipping the page, take a look at oil. Well, down on news that plant meeting this week of OPEC Plus, including Russia, will be delayed. There are new disagreements, we're told. Saudi Arabia and Russia want the U.S. to join any production cut, but Trump suggesting he will impose tariffs on foreign oil instead if necessary. And the yuan, uh, the stock market is shut, but yuan trading 710.50 currently. Vaughn. Well, has the fallout from Luck and Coffee's accounting scandal is spreading far beyond the high-flying Starbucks challenger, renewing concerns about Chinese corporate governance and threatening overseas IPOs. The coffee chain says its COO and some underlings may have fabricated billions of yuan in sales, upending what was supposed to be one of China's best growth stories. Let's bring in Nana Li, senior research analyst at the Asian Corporate Governance Association. She joins us on the line from Hong Kong. Nana, thank you so much for joining us. We mentioned this is one of the biggest growth stories we've seen in China in, in recent years. And in just less than a year after its IPO, its fall from grace. What ultimately went wrong at Luckin? Oh, I think this case is a, a straightforward fraud case, as the company reported itself to the SEC. 
So as you see, just within a year of this IPO, uh, we are already seeing the share price uh, plunge uh, 88% on the Thursday night. So I think it's a, as the company has uh, reported itself to the SEC, there's no doubt about the, the behavior, mis misconduct of the company. I mean, there were a lot of early backers as well, big investors like the likes of GIC, BlackRock, that invested into this company. What do you think they were missing? What red flags did they miss? Yeah, I think, I think well, all these investors joined later in the round. I think they, they are taking a, a huge loss of the company. But uh, I think the first uh, and the second round of the investors, they, they have already kept their shares uh, soon after the company went listed. Uh, Nana, how damaging is this for China Inc., given that uh, Chinese companies listed in the U.S., uh, are, their credibility is already questionable right now? Yeah, I think this is a very bad example for the China Inc., and it will cause a long tail damage to the image of China Inc., uh, not just the ones already listed uh, overseas, and especially in the U.S., but also the ones that are getting prepared to list uh, in, the, in the overseas market. And also their investors. So, as you, as you said, the image of China Inc. is already uh, vulnerable uh, since 10 years ago about uh, some shop sellers attacking at Chinese companies listed in the U.S. And uh, as we see on Thursday, a number of U.S. listed companies, their share price also plunged along with the uh, locking as investors starting to question in their, their accounts as well. And uh, it's of course, very bad to the credibility of China's Chinese, Chinese uh, companies between the U.S. And uh, also domestically, as uh, Lacking used to be a star company, and uh, it got listed within two years of its uh, uh, establishment. And a lot of startups are seeing it as a role model uh, amid the new economy wave. And also, uh, the company itself branded uh, uh, it as a Chinese Starbucks. And uh, with all its high-profile campaigns and uh, the with good performance of the share price, uh, it's now setting a very, I think, bad um, atmosphere um, among the startups, startups uh, in China. And uh, as China is gradually opening up yeah. its economy to the foreigners, I think it's very, uh, I think it's very important that the regulators and the investors pay more attention to the track record of the company in the global context. Nana, thank you. Nana Lee there uh, from the Asian Corporate Governance Association joining us from Hong Kong. Well, the U.S. labor market cratered in March and what could be a curtain raiser for even further weakness ahead. The Richmond Fed president spoke exclusively to Bloomberg about emergency lending facilities and his emotional reaction to the massive job miss. It is a sad day. We'd uh, had job growth for, gosh, well over a decade, uh, and it is, uh, it's hard to see the numbers turn negative. But I think everyone uh, expects a very serious uh, downward tilt on the job side. And this is just the first indicator. If you look at initial unemployment claims for the last two weeks, um, the highest ever had been 700,000 in 1982. Last week was 3.3 million. This week was 6.6 .6 million. So unfortunately, I think the employment numbers are going to get worse before they get better. Yeah, I'm getting uh, forecasts in from some economists that suggest in April we'd see anywhere from 10 to 20 million jobs lost. Does that seem crazy to you? Does the, the Bank of Richmond have any kind of forecast at this point? Well, this is so unprecedented, I think. Uh, point forecasting is a pretty uh, silly thing to try to do. But what I do try to do is just look at the numbers uh, just to get some perspective on it. Restaurants and bars in this country employ about 12 million people. Uh, physical retail, excluding food and drug, another 11. Travel and entertainment, another five. So even in those three sectors, which you know have been hit unbelievably hard, you can get to 30 million pretty quickly. So I don't think numbers like 10 or 20 million are out of the pale. Well, at this point, um, what are CEOs, what are mom and pop stores telling you in your district about the conditions they see? Well, I, I divide the companies into three buckets. There are service industries, uh, like the ones I was just talking about. There's a lot of emotion there. 
Um, in a lot of cases, really good, viable businesses have been shut down um, in the pursuit of a, a public health solution. And uh, they have hope. Uh, in particular, a number of them are in the process of applying uh, to this new small business uh, loan program. Uh, but they don't know for sure whether they're going to get the money, and they don't know how, sure, how long this is going to last and whether the money will bridge them. So there's a lot of sadness there, a lot of emotion um, uh, in that sector. Then I'd say there are a bunch of essential industries. Uh, we have a cash processing operation, uh, but you've put hospitals and food processing and fire and safety and, and the like. Um, they're proud. Uh, that they are essential to uh, making this country uh, operate, uh, but they're nervous. Um, they're nervous about their health. Um, you do see increased absenteeism. Uh, you see some supply chain issues in those places. They, they know they need to deliver, but, but they're nervous. And then there's the wide swath of other businesses uh, in this country, construction, manufacturing. Many of them are down, uh, but they're still hopeful. Uh, they're, they are seeing drops in demand, but they're making their best efforts to weather through it. Uh, and they just have hope uh, that there's uh, uh, light at the end of the tunnel here. Well, this all adds new urgency to the effort to get loans, to get operating capital to companies. How fast is the Fed going to be able to stand up the Main Street lending program? When can you start lending to people who need the money? Well, we want to achieve the goals of this legislation, which has put a, a lot of money behind uh, supporting the economy and, and businesses in need. Uh, it will just take time to work the details uh, with Treasury, who is our co-sponsor on this. Um, and as you can see with the uh, small loans, the SBA program that's just got announced, a lot of the devil's in the details. It's just complicated to get right. It's complicated to pick out uh, the right segment so you get money to the people who truly are in need. It's challenging to define the vehicles and the instruments, and then, of course, how much risk you want to bear. So we're working hard, and we'll, we're trying to get it out as fast as we can. I'm glad you brought up the risk question, because there are people who say, you know, the federal legislation says no buybacks, no dividends, no big raises for CEOs, but there are reports that the Fed doesn't think that's going to necessarily apply to them, that if you put those strictures on, companies might not apply for loans, which would be worse, because then they might have trouble keeping people on payrolls. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I just say all this stuff is being worked together with Treasury and, you know, give us a little bit of time to try to land the parameters of this. Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin speaking exclusively to Bloomberg. Play more to come. Up ahead, we have uh, the latest on the situation on the virus. Signs that the UK may be emerging as Europe's next outbreak hotspot as Boris Johnson is taken to hospital, unable to shake off the virus. This is Bloomberg. True diversification. That's what adding commodities exposure to your stock and bond portfolio can help provide. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is the standard for commodity market exposure. 23 traded commodities are represented. Agriculture, livestock, metals, and energy. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is the benchmark most widely used by investment professionals globally. Track your commodity investments with a proven financial information partner. The Bloomberg Commodity Index. True diversification.
This is Bloomberg Markets Asia. Europe's four worst hit countries have reported declines in the pace of the coronavirus deaths. This, as Prime Minister Boris Johnson's uh, hospitalization, shifts the focus to the UK. Markets co anchor Rishat Slamat has the latest developments. Rish. Yeah, the, uh, the Prime Minister admitted to hospital he's been struggling to recover from. Uh, COVID-19 uh, disease and this is dealing a serious blow to the UK as it prepares perhaps and arguably for the worst of the crisis. Now almost 5,000 people have died of the disease in the UK so far and according to government advisors and scientists the peak of the outbreak is likely to hit in the next seven to ten days. On Sunday night we saw Queen Elizabeth coming out making a rare televised address to the nation appealing for unity and <laughs> invoking the spirit of a wartime sacrifice to defeat the pandemic. Now, while Johnson does remain technically in charge, he's going to be unable to chair uh, the critical daily meeting, which is designed to, of course, coordinate the efforts against this disease and its spread. Is de facto Deputy uh, Dominic Raab will be taking charge of that meeting, all against this backdrop of uh, the UK ramping up in the number of uh, people being affected and the number of people dying, while Europe's worst hit countries uh, share the latest data from Spain, Italy, and France suggesting measures that have halted to the economies and force people to stay at home are indeed having an effect here. Italy, for one, reporting the lowest single-day coronavirus deaths in two and a half weeks. What we have is the country on a strict lockdown now, and the hardest-hit region is Lombardy there. And over the weekend, it required citizens leaving their homes uh, to shield their mouths and noses with masks or other coverings and insisting that the, re the residents remain inside for all but uh, essential activities. So we've got that lockdown there in Italy. On top of that, we've got uh, the country preparing for a fifth week of these measures here. Opposition leader uh, Matteo Salvini calling on the government of uh, Giuseppe Conte to open churches for the coming Easter holiday. Now, churches were kept open for about three weeks, uh, according to reports, and that might have made this much worse in Italy as, uh, than anywhere else, uh, say, from the United States and China. Uh, on top of that, we've got France, a total number of fatalities there on the way up. But again, uh, we see a, a sense of, of, of perhaps cresting here as well. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we've got uh, uh, Spain actually now overtaking uh, Italy as uh, the main epicenter in Europe. They continue to struggle to curtail the virus of the virus here. Uh, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez announcing plans to extend their own lockdown until the 25th of April. Spain's confirmed cases increased by 7,026 to 124,736 over the past 24 hours. And we had deaths rising by 809 to 11,744. So that's where we are currently with Europe, at least, guys. Yeah, and Rish, closer to home uh, in India, the country has, has banned the export of an anti-malaria drug. What does that tell us about what's happening in that country? Well, Donald Trump has repeatedly touted this drug, hydrochloroquine, if I can pronounce it right, and he's touted it as a game changer in the fight against this pathogen. India, meanwhile, has said that they're going to prohibit without any exceptions and with immediate effect export of it. And the trade regulator had last month restricted overseas shipments of the drug, allowing only limited exceptions, such as humanitarian reasons and meeting prior commitments. But, but this is a move, of course, here uh, to actually just totally ban the export of it. Now, this is against the backdrop of, uh, of a country which has a mass migration taking place, and we've been seeing television images of that. And, and trying to trace and contain outbreaks in settlements or slums, as you like it, uh, as you call, as one could call it, like Taravi, which is just about three miles from Mumbai's key business district, and of course Mumbai is the financial capital of India, home to the biggest stock exchange and all the big banks, the Western banks here as well. Uh, the thing is, we've got thousands of people who are trying to get home here still, and the, the danger there is that uh, this uh, cl close uh, proximity of slums could make this really this contagion uh, just spread like wildfire and that would mean that the hospitals in the country and right uh, right across the, the, the region perhaps could be overwhelmed by by this as well so uh, this is the real challenge that india is fighting against the, 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 in its fight against the deadly coronavirus which now has sickened over 1.2 million around the world and killed more than 64,000 people that's you
All right, that was Rishad Sloman, our markets co-anchor, uh, on the line there. Now, in a moment, Samsung earnings will reveal how bad things could get for global tech with first quarter results affected by the coronavirus. We have a preview coming up before those results come out on Tuesday. This is Bloomberg. Melinda Gates, thank you so much for joining us on Bloomberg Studio 1.0. Who shaped my views were the women I talked to. I think Facebook's probably won in a lot of ways. Running Microsoft was a ton of fun, and it was, you know, it's kind of inspirational. This is the weekly review of the most important business news and interviews from Bloomberg Television around the world. I hope that banks will follow, and we have seen other banks following uh, the ECB recommendation this morning. This had unique credit. I think it's important for banks to be here to support the economy. Banks are part of the solution. Let's do a quick check of the latest business flash headlines. Aircraft engine maker Rolls-Royce will reportedly scrap profit targets this week, suspend its dividend for the first time since listing in 1987 and announce new credit facilities worth more than a billion pounds. The FT says the news may come later Monday. The company's stock slumped 31% last week to its lowest since October 2008. The paper says about half of Rolls-Royce's 7,500 workers may be furloughed. Credit Suisse is said to have pulled out of the planned IPO of We Doctor in Hong Kong. The bank was originally picked alongside JP Morgan and uh, CMB International to lead a share sale expected before the end of the year. We Doctor is one of China's biggest healthcare startups and aims to raise up to a billion US dollars. However, sources tell us Credit Suisse is no longer working on the deal. And Tencent is looking to take its paid music app Jukes to Africa after it proved a hit in Southeast Asia. Jukes has become one of the most popular music apps in emerging markets since launching in 2015. It rivals Spotify, in which Tencent also has a stake. Tencent hasn't enjoyed many of its successes outside gaming. Jukes is an exception because it doesn't compete in established markets such as the US and Europe. Bye. Has taken a look at markets right now. Uh, we have seen quite a turnaround when it comes to risk assets here on this Monday morning to kick off the trading week. But keep in mind, most some big markets are closed. The likes of China, Thailand, uh, Macau, as well as India are closed for holidays. So, but we are still seeing some decent gains in Australia, uh, Singapore, uh, Indonesia just entering that bull market after uh, what we've seen in the last two weeks or so. So certainly seeing some momentum here right now. The dollar, though, is still quite strong. We're seeing a mixed picture when it comes to fixed income and WTI still heading lower as we count down to that OPEC plus meeting. Still a lot of uncertainty about what could come out of that. And of course, the Saudi is delaying releasing its official selling price until the day after the OPEC meeting as well. Perhaps a signal that they are ready to ratchet up this price war if there is no deal reached. But WTI, we're at 27.21 a barrel right now. And looking ahead, Samsung will give some insight on the health of the global chip industry when it reports preliminary first quarter earnings tomorrow. Chip makers have been riding a surge in online activity with millions of people working from home. Let's bring in executive editor for Asia Tech, Peter Elstrom, joining us on the line right now. Peter, let's go through what's expected from Samsung tomorrow morning. Uh, hi. Yeah, Samsung, of course, is best known for its own phones. Uh, it is the largest uh, seller of, of mobile phones, but it also supplies components for 
uh, many other players in the tech industry, including Apple and Huawei. So it acts as sort of a bellwether for how things are going in tech. They also report uh, very early in the quarter, so we'll get preliminary earnings uh, tomorrow and then the final earnings later on. Uh, so we're able to see a little bit how demand has gone uh, over this uh, first quarter of the year uh, in the impact of the virus. About three months ago, Samsung uh, was optimistic that the tech industry was turning a corner and the demand for memory chips in particular was going to pick back up and prices were going to stabilize. We think that that has not been the case uh, in the end, of course, because of the virus and because of a slowdown in demand. But we'll get the specifics uh, tomorrow morning. Peter, Samsung's full year forecast could change dramatically depending on how long this outbreak lasts. Uh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Um, what our sources have been telling us is that uh, Samsung is trying to figure out exactly how dramatic and how uh, deep the effect of the virus is going to uh, be on the customers that they supply for memory chips and displays and other kinds of components. Uh, Samsung itself has had to shut down some of its own operations temporarily, um, which has affected a bit their ability to operate. But they're also making contingency plans for later on in the year. Uh, sources tell us that under the worst case scenario, they feel like they may miss their own forecast by double digits. Um, if things go bad, but they're, they're, they're just trying to figure out how their customers are going to fare, both the consumers that buy their, their own consumer electronics, but also uh, the Clipper customers that are buying components from them. Peter, thank you. Peter Elstrom, our executive editor for Asia Tech, joining us from Tokyo with what to expect out of Samsung tomorrow. Could be offering a glimpse of how these tech giants are really dealing with this coronavirus right now. But of course, uh, we won't be able to see the, the different segments of the business, but certainly we're going to get just the fresh top and, and bottom lines uh, for the preliminary results, of course. Uh, just looking at markets, of course, we're looking ahead to that OPEC Plus meeting. That's very much still a lot of question marks of what could happen. But but U.S. futures really continue to support this rally. We are expecting uh, when it comes to this week, the weekly jobless claims number is certainly going to be more of a focus. We have a minutes coming out from the Fed. The RBA and BOK are also expected to meet this week, but unlikely they're going to do anything given the fact that they already had their emergency meetings last week and last month, I should say, and we already saw uh, cuts uh, when it comes to interest rates. So still seeing a decent session here in Asia. We're going to take and pass it over to Daybreak Middle East next. This is Bloomberg. another day of risk off across the financial markets we bring you special coverage of all the price action and implications here on Bloomberg television
when opportunity knocks at the door, don't say, blimey, I've still got my pyjamas on. Say yes to stuff and it will take you into some places. Well, we're clearly going through some very unusual uh, times uh, and, you know, e enormous uh, difficulties uh, getting groups of people to agree on things. From Bloomberg's European headquarters in the city of London, join us on Leaders with LACWA. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Middle East. The top stories this morning. President Trump sounds a more upbeat note on the coronavirus, saying he's seeing infections starting to level off. Italy and Spain are reporting falling death rates. Markets are higher on the optimistic news. All falls again as OPEC delays emergency talks. Saudi Arabia and Russia still blame each other for the price crash as the pandemic throttles demand for energy. And coming up, we speak exclusively to the UAE billionaire Khalif Abdur about the coronavirus impact on his many businesses. It's just gone 8 a.m. across the Emirates. It's Daybreak Middle East. I'm Manish Krani in Dubai. And I'm Yusuf Gamal Adin. Let's get straight to some of the action in specific asset classes. We are seeing a lot of appetite for additional exposure in things like U.S. equities. Because for the S&P 500, meaning we currently called about 3.4% higher. The market's live team pointing out that investors are trading the ebb and flow of virus cases, looking past the massive economic pain. And that could be a bit of a red flag, reinforcing their concerns that the real capitulation is yet to come. The folks at Morgan Stanley, they're holding on to their guns. They're sticking to the recent view that the worst may be behind us. U.S. 10-year yield 0.63%, a bit under pressure then amid the wider risk on push. The long end suffering the most into this week's front-loaded and upsized auction schedule as well. We've got a, quite a packed agenda, Manus. Indeed, and JP Morgan, of course, saying that a floor may be settling into the oil market. Crushed on the open, down by 12%. We're down 2% now, a delay in the OPEC Plus meeting. It's one in, all in. The USA, Russia, and Saudi. It sounds like the Russians and the Saudis are in the blame game. They want the U.S. on board. What is the magic number? 10 million barrels, 10% of the world production, as Mr. Trump reverts back to tariff man. He threatens very substantial levies. Iraq is optimistic of a deal. The UAE is confident of a deal. Uh, to the dollar index, okay, equity markets are flying higher, but so too is the dollar. Last week, we put on 2.2%. Pence says there are glimmers of progress, not so much in the dollar if you take that as the benchmark of risk. To the President of the United States, Mr. Trump is sounding more upbeat in terms of the coronavirus, dropping his warning of a horrendous time to come for America. And he's seeing infections start to level off. Vice President Mike Pence agrees, saying the administration is beginning to see a glimmer of progress. New York State reported a lower rate of deaths on Sunday, prompting optimism from the White House. New York, the first time where the deaths were less from the previous day, that's the first drop so far. So maybe that's a good sign. It could be. We hope we're seeing a leveling off in the hottest spots of them all. In the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is in hospital for coronavirus tests after suffering a substantial setback and remaining in isolation for 10 days. Downing Street says it's a precaution and he remains in charge of the government. Johnson's pregnant partner is showing symptoms but has yet to be tested. The UK has seen its deadliest day yet with more than 700 new fatalities taking the total to above 4,300. To Europe, the country's worst hit by the coronavirus have reported death rates falling, with Italy saying the worst may be over. The latest figures suggest tight restrictions on public movement are having a positive effect. Between them, Italy and Spain have the most infections in Europe, but the Public Health Institute in Rome says it's seen a significant slowdown of the spread. Mohamed Apabai is from Citigroup Global Markets. He's the head of Asia Trading Strategy. Mohamed, uh, good to have you with us. So we are in these various waves. Uh, the White House sees glimmers of hope. Trump had been talking about a horrendous deadly period, but if we look towards Japan, we're about to establish a state of emergency in Japan. So 
cyclically those, those bids and offers. Are we in command of enough bullish information to form a base in equity markets? I think it's a little bit premature to uh, conclude that. I mean, I think in the U.S. what is uh, happening is, and this is a characteristic pattern we're seeing in any country, when you take measures to um, control the population and impose these social uh, restrictions, eight to ten days later, you see the r naught figure, the, the number of people that are being infected, um, actually drop. And so if you look at the U.S., they started imposing more restrictions on the 25th of March. And so what we are seeing is the consequence of that eight to ten days later. Now, even uh, where we are right now, we're still um, at quite an elevated level. So I think it's too early to declare yet uh, a victory over it. I think the, the danger where, I, where we're uh, most concerned is really in some of these emerging markets where the, the reporting is uh, very weak, uh, in particular at countries like India and Indonesia um, and some of the ASEAN countries, especially with some of these religious holidays coming up, um, to uh, see if there's going to be a spread uh, amongst those countries. And I think uh, em emerging markets are a lot more vulnerable here. Well, Mohammed, you hit the nail on the head because we have the WCRS function, the world currency ranker, and we've put emerging markets into that category on a total return basis. And the numbers are nothing short of, of staggering. I mean, losses in excess of 20% for currencies from the South African rand to the Mexican peso, the Brazilian real, and the Indonesian rupiah. Uh, with the dollar strength showing no signs of abating anytime soon, what's going to be the solution here? Because time is running out and EM is going to crack. Well, I think this, even within EM, there's sort of different grades uh, within that. So if you look at somewhere like Taiwan, um, you know, places like South Africa obviously have had um, uh, a sharp fall, uh, Mexico as well. Um, but really, it's a score. country to keep the numbers under track. The one that is surprising to me a little bit is uh, the Philippines peso, which hasn't really moved uh, as much as uh, what, what we would expect. Um, and I think the Indian rupee is uh, probably likely to come under continued pressure. I think any country where you've got a fiscal deficit and a current account deficit as well, um, they're going to be obviously under a lot more pressure because the fiscal room that they have to move in is going to be uh, a lot more restricted. But I think that uh, the impact on the emerging markets and the emerging market currencies uh, are probably just beginning right now. Mohammed, if that is the beginning of that wave in EM, as you point out, the policy responses that we've seen, many are saying that the Fed opening up swap lines to extended numbers of counterparties is in many ways uh, a form of relief to EM who don't have dollar swap lines. Would you concur with that? And will that come to bear in your thinking? I think it helps, but I don't think it solves it. I think that, um, you know, the many of these countries have got, um, I mean, for example, if you look at uh, India, you're looking, uh, I think the previous um, uh, RBI governor, Mr. Rajan, said this was the biggest economic emergency that India has faced since, uh, since independence. Um, I think that the uh, stimulus that is being provided at 0.8% of GDP is far lower than what China is doing. It's much, much lower than, for example, what is being done in the West, where the average uh, stimulus is um, at least 5%. It's about 5.8% uh, for most of those countries. The ability of those countries uh, to absorb this hit is going to be probably uh, a lot more limited. And I think um, here is at uh, the banking systems, where the banking system yeah. is reliant on, on dollar funding. Mohamed, hold that thought. Uh, we're still going to get through quite a few things. Mohamed Abebae stays with us. We've got some breaking lines in the Bloomberg from Emark Properties. The bellwether, the heavyweight of the Dubai Stock Exchange. 
coming through then with an announcement that they're going to sell 80% of the downtown district cooling plant. That is coming in at a price tag of 2.48 billion dirhams, according to the valuation suggested by EMAR. Uh, that is 80% of shares in the downtown district cooling plant, and that is being sold to Tabreed, who is the heavy player in that space. Uh, the real estate, of course, has been under massive pressure year to date. The stocks are down almost 50%. And the UAE has ramped up its stimulus plan with the central bank saying it would release $16.6 billion of support. So we're going to talk about the Middle East markets shortly, but oil is the alpha for markets this week. We'll talk oil. Finland's central bank governor Olli Rehn says Europe needs continent-wide fiscal action. The ECB policymaker also expressed optimism that finance ministers will agree on a joint response when they meet this week. This time uh, now the action uh, is uh, essentially needed uh, uh, from the member states uh, and uh, from the European Union political decision makers in a sense that uh, we need uh, a strong fiscal policy response uh, in parallel with uh, a strong monetary policy response. Uh, fiscal yeah. policy, if uh, directed uh, uh, rightly, then uh, it can have a very substantial impact uh, on the real economy and uh, quite quickly. Yes. Um, just to stick with the monetary policy uh, a moment, Oli Rain, and in, on the topic of taking further action... Does having PEPP with essentially no limits on how much debt you can buy remove the need for launching outright monetary transactions? These are not uh, alternatives. Uh, and uh, I would not like to speculate at this stage uh, whether we would uh, need to use uh, the outright monetary transactions uh, or not. Uh, it is uh, one part of uh, our toolbox uh, and uh, as you may recall or you may read from my book, uh, it was uh, a critical decision in uh, August, uh, September 2012, following Mahmoud Draghi's uh, now legendary speech uh, in London during the Olympic Games uh, in, in July 2012, when he said that uh, within our mandate, uh, we will do whatever it takes to ensure the future of the, of the euro. So then the OMT was the was the tool 
but uh, you may recall that uh, that also requires uh, a program under the European Stability Mechanism, and uh, this seems to have been rather contentious uh, among the member states uh, in their discussions uh, recently. Will they come to an agreement on that, Oli Rain? I think uh, the most urgent thing to get to, to an agreement is uh, a fiscal policy, a coordinated uh, and uh, strong uh, European fiscal policy response. Oli Rain, looking further ahead, I mean, th when this crisis is over, do you think there are going to be long-term structural changes in terms of consumption, supply chains, uh, even inflation as a result of this in the euro area? Nobody knows, but uh, everybody is uh, thinking and talking about that, and uh, rightly so, because we have to start, uh, apart from the acute uh, policy measures, uh, crisis measures, we have to start thinking about the exit from the crisis. Uh, and uh, one issue which is uh, certainly of uh, matter of concern is that uh, we all are going to pile up uh, quite a lot of uh, public yeah, debt. Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, uh, that's uh, worse of a problem if it is one of uh, than uh, letting the whole national economy or European economy fall with bankruptcies and uh, mass unemployment. Oli Rain, very briefly, should there be private debt cancellation, as Mario Draghi suggested in an FT op-ed? I didn't read it uh, as uh, straightforward as you, as you propose, uh, but uh, we will uh, have to think uh, about uh, how we will deal with uh, the massive uh, problem of uh, private and uh, public debt. Oli Rain there speaking earlier to Bloomberg. Let's circle back to the market action. We have U.S. equity futures up strongly as a result of some of the coronavirus case numbers in the U.S. starting to fall and elsewhere too. But overall, the economic shock is still very real, and that is a cause for alarm to the market's live team. But at the moment, it is a move forward. Mohamed Larian has written an editorial as well. Uh, you can check it out on your terminal. He says... It's important to pursue a strategy that focuses overwhel overwhelmingly on the areas touched directly by the Fed liquidity. So that means trade up in quality by sharply reducing credit and equity exposures to those companies at high risk of default or downgrade below investment grade. Let's just uh, take a look at some of the equity futures in the United States of America because we seem to be in this melt up Monday mode. The forced liquidation has passed, according to Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley. That's largely behind us. Valuations are the most attractive since 2011. Now, if you take that house view, Yusuf, versus RBC, they've done their institutional survey. Um, they say that institutions are optimistic, that they never actually capitulated. So I think it's the use of language, really, isn't it, from Mike Pence, from Donald Trump, and from the White House. And th the data, as you said, the first thing you said this morning when you walked in, which was the trifecta, the U.S., Spain and Italy, the data improves. Yeah, in the meantime, you've got uh, quite a few moves here across the curve as uh, the focus is on risk assets. Um, in the meantime, also, I'd like to talk a little bit about crude oil. We're awaiting that meeting at the end of the week. Eurasia is saying that even if OPEC plus plus comes through with a bunch of cuts, uh, it would raise Brent to just 30 to 35 dollars a barrel. So the gains would be capped on that. Uh, interesting column out as well from some of our oil strategists saying that the virtual meeting is really going to bring up the chance for the Saudis to put out their ultimatum and put it out clearly. Yeah, I, I, by the way, it sounds as if it's uh, all in, all for one. Um, so you've got the Saudis and the Russians really lambassing one another. Um, that was sort of into the close over, over the weekend. Then you've got Tariff Man returning in the middle of the mire of coronavirus commodity implosion. How do you bring a global deal? Well, Donald Trump would suggest that that is, I'm going to import, uh, um, um, you know, apply tariffs here in the United States of America if I can bring the rest of the world to heel on that. So still, we wait to see what, what the consensus building phase is this week. 10 million barrels is 10% of global output. Yeah, gold a bit on the pressure here, down a fifth of 1%. Uh, I mean, bullion is challenging treasuries as the best performing haven year to date. We'll get into a lot of the other key market themes shortly. This is Bloomberg.
even in a circumstance where you're down 80 percent of the rest of the year we're still going to have four billion dollars of cash uh we're going to have access to a two billion dollar revolver we think it's highly 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 unlikely but we are planning for the worst case I was actually poor. No foreplay? Eat your bag of lays with a smile on your face. If all the diseases have been taken, I'll, I'll take a taxi. The UAE has ramped up its stimulus plan with the central bank saying it would release $16.6 billion to support lending to the economy. Meanwhile, allegations of fraud pose new challenges for UAE banks. Simone Foxman has been tracking the stories from Doha. Simone, good to have you with us this morning. Can we start with the stimulus measures um, in terms of what we can expect a new salvo of aid? The detail. Yeah, good morning, Manis. So the, that $16.6 billion that you mentioned, that's really the amount of cash reserves that the UAE is uh, going to require banks to have on hand for demand deposits. They're lowering that ratio that they normally require from 14% to 7%. And, and so, you know, demand deposits is money withdrawn without prior notice. So things like checking accounts. But there's also a bunch more in that stimulus plan, things like capital buffer relief, zero cost funding support, uh, liquidity bu buffer relief. And then there's things for small businesses, too. Um, so there had already been some suggestions about or some plans um, about support for retail and corporate customers that would need to come from the banks. Uh, so this new stimulus pack, stimulus measures is going to extend those plans to the end of 20. Uh, and that's really important because uh, small, medium-sized enterprises seen as the, uh, the folks that are going to get most hit, particularly in Dubai, by the slowdown that we've seen uh, from the coronavirus. So this has actually already been pretty credit negative for the banks in the UAE, however, despite the fact that this might be beneficial for the economy. Um, over the weekend, Moody's said that it, it sees a material decline in asset quality mm -hmm. likely to be at the banks. Um, and, and they generally say that Dubai is going to be harder hit than Abu Dhabi, and, and that's maybe where we should expect some of the pressure. You know, but at the end of the day, when you, know, you look at this from an investor yeah. perspective, there's always this, uh, this specter of government support uh, behind the banking system in the UAE. That is, that is positive. Let's talk about those banks in the UAE because you've got lower rates, you've got the fallout of the coronavirus, and then you've got falling oil prices as well. And then to top it all off, they're grappling with these allegations of fraud at NNC Health. It's really put a crater into the dent of the wider assets in the United Arab Emirates. Run me through some of the announcements that came out in the last 24 hours because clearly the regulator may have been pushing a lot of these, uh, a lot of these revelations. Yeah, so it's a real, uh, well, triple whammy maybe uh, for the UAE banks. Uh, and the, and the, chief, the chief bank that, that this is affecting is Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank, uh, which has disclosed that it has $1.16 billion in exposure both to NMC and to Enabler. Um, now, that bank said that over the weekend that it had, it had applied um, to UK, the UK's high court asking for the company to be put into administration um, but this is a, maybe a bad time for that to happen. Um, NMC Health is the largest private healthcare company in the UAE, 
And, you know, we're facing a pandemic here, uh, and that is sort of the criticism that the executive chairman uh, made yesterday, um, and in fact, accusing that bank of, you know, I'll quote, you know, him verbatim here, putting its own interests above not only the other creditors, but also the health and safety of UAE residents. So that's like some, some pretty, uh, uh, you know, harsh statement right there um, for NMC Health. And so this, I think we can expect this to be a controversial situation going forward. Yeah, you've got to wonder who the credit officers uh, at, at the various institutions looking at those numbers. They're, they're pretty tough, pretty telling story. Can we talk about one of the national companies, Emirates Airline? It's joining the host of companies, raising billions of dollars in loans. So what's the outlook? Because we know the, the government is backstopping uh, Emirates Airlines. So what's the outlook? Yeah, I think, you know, as far as airlines go, that industry has been so deeply affected by the coronavirus uh, and the grounding of flights across the world. I think Emirates is seen as one of the healthier candidates likely to get through this okay, you know, chiefly because the government is willing to step in and backstop, uh, you know, backstop the airline here. Uh, every airline around the world needs cash now. It's probably a little surprise that Emirates needs it too. And I will say that Emirates Airlines that, you know, trading pretty positively for airlines, it yields about 4.2 percent. That's a little higher than it was a couple months ago. That's debt due in 2025, I should mention. You know, but this is still around June, July levels. So we haven't seen a, a huge credit impact here. Uh, we should also note that Emirates uh, may restart some flights as of today, um, as it sort of, you know, tries to feel out, you know, how this pandemic is is, is going to influence op its operations going forward. Simone, excellent reporting. Thank you for that. Simone Foxman, our Bloomberg correspondent in Doha. I want to get back to the pricing action in Asia specifically to start off with because stocks are still higher risk on then as the number of cases in some of the key hotspots, including the United States and the UK, appear to be leveling off or decreasing. Uh, Japanese stocks in focus following declines in the daily fatality toll there. The Japanese prime minister is seen moving closer to declaring a state of emergency in a matter of days after the total confirmed infections in Tokyo surged over the weekend to top 8,000. That's according to a newspaper report. But again, that shows you that this is far from over in terms of understanding the scale of the impact. Well, understanding the scale and, and when that end line or whether we're getting into a better situation, Yusuf, is the backdrop to JP Morgan's note this morning. It's on Bloomberg.com. Slowing U.S. virus cases put a floor underneath the stocks. And they say that the S&P rally may peak near 2750, 2850. They say the deceleration trend in terms of what you're seeing on the VIX, that's gonna be critical for them. Volatility dropping uh, in, in, in syncopated moves, really. And if you go to the data, which is what we both looked at this morning, the number of states with a growth rate above 20% from 10, uh, from 40, just over two weeks ago. opportunity uh, we were able to give a big push uh, to develop our catering business uh, so that is uh, that is something that we think uh, we'll continue to work on 
in San Francisco, a lot of tech action today. Our top stories this morning in D.C. and the Dow Baltimore. and the S&P. Shall we? So the euro on a seven-day winning streak. Sizable moves in the currency market. Down we begin in the oil patch. Saudi Arabia. Brent crude, oil pretty much unchanged. Welcome to Bloomberg, the first word Asia. We U.S. and Japan duke it out over exchange China's rate. slumping onshore bond market. Another day of risk off across the financial markets. We bring you special coverage of all the price action and implications here on Bloomberg Television. The El Haptour Group is one of the region's most respected conglomerates with interests in the hospitality, automotive, real estate, education, and publishing sectors. So just how will the company weather the coronavirus storm and the oil price war as well? Joining us now is Khalaf al Habtour, He's the chairman of al Habtour Group. Welcome back to the program. I mean, we'll get straight to it. How are you uh, dealing with the impact of the coronavirus? What changes have you made in some of your businesses? Well, I think uh, all the world is affected, not only us here, all over the world, whether it is the United States, Europe, Asia, Middle East. Definitely, we, I mean, such a uh, virus uh, we have uh, also infected in, uh, in, our, uh, in our business. Especially we have 14 hotels in, uh, in Dubai and in, in the world, and all they are closed. I mean, imagine the number of stuff we have, the number of commitment, etc. All, yes, I mean, uh, all they are closed and... Uh, it is impacted also on the other business like the motors, I mean, and else, you know, a lot of things really. But, you know, I don't want to complain. I want to be positive rather than negative because it is impacted all over the world. And uh, we are reorganizing ourselves. We are thinking maybe this is something will will put us in different way of thinking rather than the, the normal thinking, the usual thinking. Yes, sir. Khalif, good morning. It's Manis. In terms of the businesses that you run, um, what kind of support are you seeing from the government? What more support do you want to see from the government from, for hotel owners like you, for the staff, for your businesses when we come through this crisis? Well, I think, you know, our government doing a great job now with, I mean, the backup of $256 billion to facilitate from the central bank to the banks, you know, to make it easy uh, for the bank and to, to push the loans and interest up to the end of the year by, you know, up to every business in the, in the country. This is something uh, excellent. Of course, I mean, w without us asking, they are every day they are thinking and they are uh, trying to post uh, uh, our, our, our uh, mind and also they are uh, working hard with us. Of course, we are checking with them. We are uh, thinking together. We are, you know, hand by hand with our government to ensure that, you know, we will be uh, recovery as soon as this. Uh, virus disappeared hopefully yeah. soon then i think we will need to uh, put hand to, uh, with our government and work hard to to make sure that uh, you know we recover soon Khalif, in terms of what yes, you've sir. been seeing at the moment because this is a rolling assessment that needs to be done uh, is more support needed from the government or more intervention from the government helpful at this point and when do you see a recovery taking place potentially well, the government, as I said, you know, they are supporting. Definitely, they are. We, we, the country need more support as well. Even they are supporting really without asking, without asking them ourselves. They are doing great job of supporting everybody in this country, not only the business, but as individual houses, everything. I mean, for example, uh, like electricity, transportation, water. Uh, you know, everything really, the, our government doing a great job. And we are our government. We are the first people who are supporting uh, more than anybody else. Of course, I mean, like England, America, everywhere else, also they are doing a great job to their people, you know. But they are, you know, uh, 
the richest country in the world. But also our government doing a great job with the cooperation with the business houses in this country. Halif, can I ask you, you talk about the banks yes. having the ability to lend. Have you had to approach any of the yes. banks to raise uh, credit lines, to raise any funding? And if so, how accommodating have the financial institutions been to you? Really, no, we haven't approached anybody to raise a loan because we don't need it. And, uh, but, you know, the bank, they are, they must obey the central bank uh, rule. Any violation, any bank who violates the instruction and the law of the bank, it means they, they have to be uh, punished. They have to be punished. And all the local banks really doing a great job with the people. They are assisting them. They are discounting. Even without, you know, uh, the government support, they are doing it themselves, the local bank, to support everything because, because they know that business houses and them, they are partners. And without the business houses, they will be in trouble. And uh, uh, business houses also will be in trouble without them. We are partners for success. But, of course, there is maybe I heard some foreign banks, they are resisting. They, are, they want to violate the, 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 yeah. the central bank uh, instruction. I mean, this is, I heard that, you know, and this will be, these banks will be whatever, one or two, I don't know. Sure. This is what I heard. They will be also punished. Yeah, we'll kind of give bank. me a bit of a sense of where you are in terms of uh, investment appetite, because in the past you've always taken tactical opportunities up and you've also extended your interest into Europe and beyond. Uh, are you sitting on enough cash or do you have enough, uh, let's say, ammunition to deploy into select uh, options as they come up? Because right now, a lot of these valuations have come down very fast. Well, uh, let me tell you something. I don't think anybody in the world now sitting in a cash. I mean, it is, it is we, uh, you know, always we, whatever results every year, we put it back into our business. I mean, I have to be very transparent. You know, we don't, we don't put safe in a different bank, you know, fixed deposit and millions or billions or whatever. No, no. We inject it into our business to make sure, you know, the continuation of our business. Of course, this virus, made us to rethink again and to restructure our work for future after the, 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 the departure of this uh, enemy. And hopefully soon we will be better management. And I can see that as soon as the announcement of the disappearance of, of this virus, there will be a lot Hello. of energy in the country. Halif, we yes, all hope that th this, this crisis, this, this virus passes and we come out of 24-hour lockdown as soon as we can. Can I ask you uh, in terms of, I want to get back to what the government is doing for the real economy, for businesses and, and for people. Do you think that we need to have, you, you okay there? You, do we need WhatsApp and Skype to be opened up? Definitely, definitely. I think... Now I think the Skype and what's up is open on, with the Wi-Fi. But really, we need, this is what the people said. I mean, definitely, I mean, they have to remove this. They let it on. RTA should uh, remove also the, uh, if the, I don't know whether they have removed the fees for the, the this is the road, you know, the highways. And uh, this is this, definitely they are thinking. They will help a lot to the people, every individual, every group, every company. Yes, um, I am with you. Uh, some, some closing thoughts, Khalif, on the postponement of Expo 2020 and what that could mean potentially for uh, any recovery anytime soon. I mean, what are you ho hoping for in terms of a rebound? I mean, the expo, the, I mean, the decision has been taken. I think it's good. And I support personally that to be moved to next year. And uh, myself, you know, I think as soon as they announce that the country is clean, the country is that people will be curious of people going out because people think they are, 
in prison rather than they are protected. You know, people are fully protected. And the great thing is the cooperation between the authority and the people, whether they are citizen or resident of this country. I mean, this is the fantastic cooperation between the two. And uh, I think I think they will definitely, first business will react within GCC and, and Asia. I don't think Europe will be will be bound to or the West in general. But definitely okay. GCC Hala, thank and you Asia very... will react positive. Yes, sir. Khalif, we look forward to speaking to you soon. I look forward to I look forward to a lunch and a brunch at one of the hotels when they re, when they re reopen. Yusuf's always available for brunch. <laughs> Halif, thank you very much, sir. You can put the vouchers in the post. We're here. Halif Al Habtour, we're not live vouchers. Uh, chairman of Al Habtour Group, joining Yusuf and myself this morning. The reality uh, of a major player here in the economy across the auto sector, hotels uh, and building. Uh, up next, we're crossing to Tel Aviv. To the Stock Exchange CEO, we have Itai Ben Zev joins Yusuf and myself to discuss the impact of coronavirus on Israel's capital markets. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Commodity investing is more than buying gold and oil. From coffee and corn to cattle and natural gas, many sectors drive the commodity markets. And the Bloomberg Commodity Index covers them all. With exposure across 23 traded commodities, Bloomberg is the standard for diversification in commodity markets. With full transparency, measure and monitor your investment performance against the benchmark used by commodity professionals globally. More than gold and oil. The Bloomberg Commodity Index. Israeli officials are rushing to stave off an economic crisis caused by the coronavirus. Unemployment surging to roughly 25%. Meanwhile, the country's benchmark stock index has sunk by 26% this year. Joining us now is the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange CEO, Itai Ben Zev. Itai, great to have you with us. So let's get straight to it. We're all trying to assess the response from governments, the response from central banks. Can I get your assessment of whether the response, policy response in Israel has been adequate and sizable enough in your opinion? Oh, good morning. I think that Bank of Israel has reacted in a, in a very positive manner. Uh, he gave a substantial amount that you know, he, will, he will, will be putting into the market. And uh, the focus now is on uh, government bonds because on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange we trade not only equities but also government bonds and corporate bonds. Uh, the Israeli government, it took some time before they released their program. Currently, they're speaking uh, uh, in terms of over $20 billion. Uh, we still want to see exactly how the money will be deployed. Uh, and this is, I think, now it's the main question in Israel, uh, the size and the way that that amount will help to get people go through these uh, difficult times. It's uh, in terms of some steps that you are taking to try and shield the exchange from potential damage or, let's say, longer lasting impact from the coronavirus fears. Uh, have you looked at potentially either limiting or outright banning short selling? Because that seems to be the talk of town at the moment. Yeah, we'll have we had several you know, people approaching us also about shutting down the exchange, limiting the 
uh, there was the, the uh, change is operating. I think very similar to what happened uh, in other exchanges all over the world. Uh, throughout March, which was a tough uh, month for all of the exchanges worldwide, uh, everything was exactly the same on the exchange. Uh, we operated, uh, we allowed uh, short. I think this is extremely important in open, transparent market to allow everybody to react the same way uh, they used to react uh, in times as volatility is lower. Uh, I think that the fact that uh, everything remained the same, even though uh, obviously our indices went down, it's extremely important for uh, uh, the day that you know the coronavirus will be less frightening and people will get more comfortable you know, from the fact that they will travel again, they will go to restaurants, to coffee shops, etc. So with regards to Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, everything is the same as it used to be. Itai, can I ask you, you mentioned what the central bank might do and corporate bonds is part of the, the, the discussion. Is it necessary for them to intervene there? And what might be the risk if they do begin to buy corporate bonds? Is there a risk of crowding out by the central bank? Well, the, the central bank, as I mentioned before, started with government bonds. And now, obviously, there's a discussion in Israel, should the Bank of Israel start buying corporate bonds, you know, similar to the Fed uh, and in other countries. I think that Israel, because during the 80s, you know, even though it's, you know, it's many years ago, but it was a big story in Israel with a very high inflation, I guess that there are still some economists that are, that they, they fear that, you know, if you put too much money, you will boost the inflation over time in Israel. Uh, on the other hand, we hear more and more economists, not only in Israel, but also in the world, that they are saying very specifically that because of what happened with the coronavirus that shut down all of the economies of the world, it is imperative to boost the economy. And regardless of the amount of money that government will put now, if the economies will stop, we'll have to put much more money in order to uh, ignite again uh, the economy. Uh, so I guess, you know, Bank of Israel is looking at the current spreads that we have in Israel. Um, and I guess that in the next uh, couple of weeks, we will see uh, what they will decide. Itai, in terms of what you're seeing from business leaders, I mean, what's sentiment like? What are the conversations you're having? And what does that tell you about how deep an impact the coronavirus is going to have on the Israeli economy? Well, I think, you know, the coronavirus is a story about uh, global leadership. I mean, we, we are seeing a virus that, you know, is common for basically all or most of the countries of the world, but there was no global leadership and global coordination between the countries. And, and I think it, it, it's a shame because, you know, this is something that the whole world could have coped in a better way if there was a cooperation. Now, with regards to business leader, I think that uh, in Israel there was a lot of focus on the health side of the corona. Uh, we are in a relatively a very good shape with regards to the health. Uh, but there are more and more business leaders that are afraid that some of the measures that have been taken by the government uh, are doing very well to the health of the population. But on the other hand, they're putting too much negative pressure on the economy, and uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, in two weeks' time when Passover, you know, Jewish holiday is, uh, is over, uh, should uh, all of the businesses in Israel should come back to usual business, be open again, or only part of them. Uh, and we are seeing more and more business leaders talking about the negative impact of the revenues, obviously, of the business because uh, uh, the shutdown that took place in Israel. As, as in other countries. Um, the other global story is about dividends and buybacks, Itai, and part of the central bank's narrative is that um, this should be reconsidered within Israel. What are your thoughts on, on, on dividends, retention of dividends on a temporary basis? Is that a smart, prudent move? That Give me your thoughts. Yeah, well, you know, as we discussed, you know, last year uh, the exchange 
just went through IPO in 2019 and went through the demutualization, uh, which took place in other markets 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, so Israel, in that respect, is not very similar to the U.S. market, for example, meaning that you know buyback is not as common uh, in Israel. We do have, obviously, companies that uh, give dividends, uh, but this is something that, uh, uh, with regard to financial education, this is something that the retail in Israel uh, is not fully aware of. So it's not a major issue in Israel. I can tell that on a global scale, uh, you know, if you have companies that gave a lot of dividend or a lot of buyback in the last couple of years, and then they need, you know, the help of the government, because what happened, obviously, it requires different approach than companies that put a lot of cash aside uh, to be prepared when, you know, something bad happens, uh, like the coronavirus or something else. So I think, you know, mainly in markets like the U.S., you know, there'll be a lot of discussions about it. but. Yeah. It's with regard to the Israeli market, it's less relevant. It has been great catching up. Thank you for that. That's uh, the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange CEO, Itai Benzev. Much. Well, coming up, the Richmond Fed president says firms must work to restore c customer confidence. Highlights from our exclusive with Thomas Barkin next. This is Bloomberg. I hope that banks will follow, and we have seen other banks following uh, the ECB recommendation this morning, besides Unicredit. I think it's important for banks to be here to support the economy. Banks are part of the solution. Fuel, corn, livestock, precious metals. Commodities are everywhere, and so is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Commodity Indices deliver leading benchmarks for true diversification. Adding commodity exposure can help hedge against inflation and diversify your stock and bond portfolios. With full data transparency and broad distribution, the Bloomberg suite of commodity indices is your measure for the commodity markets. With Bloomberg, you've got the markets covered. Let's talk about the U.S. labor market because it cratered in March in what could be a curtain raiser for even further weakness ahead. The Richmond Fed president has weighed in. He spoke exclusively to Bloomberg about emergency lending facilities and his emotional reaction to the massive jobs miss. It is a sad day. We'd uh, had job growth for, gosh, well over a decade, uh, and it is, uh, it's hard to see the numbers turn negative. But I think everyone uh, expects uh, very serious uh, downward tilt on the job side. And this is just the first indicator. If you look at initial unemployment claims for the last two weeks, um, the highest ever had been 700,000 in 1982. Last week was 3.3 million. This week was 6.6 .6 million. So unfortunately, I think the employment numbers are going to get worse before they get better. Yeah, I'm getting uh, forecasts in from some economists that suggest in April we'd see anywhere from 10 to 20 million jobs lost. Does that seem crazy to you? Does the, the Bank of Richmond have any kind of forecast at this point? Well, this is so unprecedented, I think. Uh, point forecasting is a pretty uh, silly thing to try to do. But what I do try to do is just look at the numbers uh, just to get some perspective on it. Restaurants and bars in this country employ about 12 million people. Uh, physical retail, excluding food and drug, another 11. Travel and entertainment, another five. So even in those three sectors, which you know have been hit unbelievably hard, you can get to 30 million pretty quickly. So I don't think numbers like 10 or 20 million are out of the pale. 
Well, this all adds new urgency to the effort to get loans, to get operating capital to companies. How fast is the Fed going to be able to stand up the Main Street lending program? When can you start lending to people who need the money? Well, we want to achieve the goals of this legislation, which is put a, a lot of money behind uh, supporting the economy and, and businesses in need. Uh, it will just take time to work the details uh, with Treasury, who is our co-sponsor on this. Um, and as you can see with the uh, small loans, the SBA program that's just got announced, a lot of the devil's in the details. It's just complicated to get right. It's complicated to pick out uh, the right segment so you get money to the people who truly are in need. It's challenging to find the vehicles and the instruments. And then, of course, how much risk you want to bear. So we're working hard and we'll, we're trying to get it out as fast as we can. I'm glad you brought up the risk question because there are people who say, you know, the federal legislation says no buybacks, no dividends, no big raises for CEOs, but there are reports that the Fed doesn't think that's going to necessarily apply to them, that if you put those strictures on, companies might not apply for loans, which would be worse because then they might have trouble keeping people on payrolls. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I just say all this stuff is being worked together with Treasury and, you know, give us a little bit of time to try to land the parameters of this. That was the Richmond Fed president there speaking exclusively to Bloomberg. Quick check in on the markets. There's a cracking function on the Bloomberg news. If you go to MLive, they're talking about the global, the global data tally that we do at Bloomberg. Uh, and that is globally fatalities are the lowest in a month. And this is the underbelly of sentiment really in, in the movement in these U.S. equity markets in terms of the data coming through from the U.S. Yeah, the Markets Live team asking the question, how long will it be before complacency is back to haunt the longer term outlook for stocks? Uh, we know that the folks at Morgan Stanley are sticking to their views. In terms of treasuries, are there a bit of pressure here amid the wider risk on push across assets? So you look at U.S. 10-year at 0 0.63. We're up about three bips. The long end suffering most into this week's front-loaded and upsized auction schedule. A three-year sale worth $40 billion on Monday, then a 10 and a 30-year reopening Tuesday and Wednesday. Let's roll it over. Have a look at the rest. As you say, there is a heavy supply, burden of supply coming there. What will happen next between the U.S. and the German curve as uh, you see an op-ed from uh, the German finance minister saying, you know, go to the ESM, go to the ESM as a go-to for uh, the help that Europe needs. Eric Lonergan is our guest host during Daybreak Europe, and we will discuss that live from London. This is Bloomberg.
true diversification. That's what adding commodities exposure to your stock and bond portfolio can help provide. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is the standard for commodity market exposure. 23 traded commodities are represented. Agriculture, livestock, metals, and energy. The Bloomberg Commodity Index is the benchmark most widely used by investment professionals globally. Track your commodity investments with a proven financial information partner. The Bloomberg Commodity Index. True diversification. Yet another day of risk off across the financial markets. We bring you special coverage of all the price action and implications here on Bloomberg Television. Good morning from London. I'm Naira Chahich with Manus Cranny live from Dubai. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe and these are today's top stories. Global stocks climb as the daily death toll from the coronavirus declines in some epicenters. President Trump says there are signs that the US outbreak is beginning to level off. Italy reports the lowest daily fatality since March 19th. Germany's finance minister reiterates the ESM can be mobilized for quick financial aid but doesn't mention joint debt. And oil gives up some of last week's rally after an OPEC Plus meeting is delayed to Thursday. Donald Trump says he doesn't think he'll have to impose tariffs on imported crude. Welcome to Daybreak Europe. Well, Manus, it looks like there's light at the end of the tunnel, according to Eric Nielsen at Unicredit, but he says it's a long tunnel. The question is, how bright do you see that light? Yes, and I think it depends which piece of research that you read uh, this morning, whether it's JP Morgan saying that the US virus cases, the, the data that we're getting through could put pressure on the VIX and create a flaw on the equity market. 27.50, 28.50 is the target. Nera, good morning. Morning, Manus. Well, if we take a look at how equities are performing, then you've got Chinese markets closed today. You've got green on the screen in Japan, a weaker yen, uh, but we're awaiting uh, Japan to declare a state of virus emergency with cases jumping there. Japan also looking to fight the virus with a two-stage stimulus plan. U.S. futures on the front foot. Of course, we did see global equities decline on the week last week. The 10-year Treasury yield had its lowest weekly close ever. And you've got BMO Capital Markets and Bank of America saying we're poised to retest that record low of 31 basis points but the yield moving slightly higher today dollar strength for a fourth straight day Boris Johnson in the UK hospitalized highlighting the challenges of fighting coronavirus in the UK we see a little bit of weakness in cable and oil also weaker today with that OPEC plus uh, and others meeting uh, move to Thursday now Manison questions over whether we can get any kind of agreement Yes, and, and the question is, Nera, is the data, uh, and we are all hostage to that and sentiment as well. Now, President Trump has warned, that, has warned that over the weekend, the fallout from the pandemic is about to get a lot worse in the U.S. Now, he said, quote, very horrendous. That's what we should prepare for. Uh, phase is looming. A day later, the president sounded more optimistic. He cited the decline in fatalities in New York as a possible sign, a possible good sign. previous day that's the first drop so far so maybe that's a good sign it could be we hope we're seeing a leveling off in the hottest spots of them all In Europe, four of its worst hit countries reported declines in the pace of coronavirus deaths and Italian health officials said his country's outbreak may be cresting. Latest data from Spain, Italy, France and the UK suggest that the containment measures that have idled millions of workers are having an effect. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was hospitalised as a precaution after failing to shake off the virus symptoms for 10 days. Now in Japan, Prime Minister Abe is reportedly set to declare a state of emergency. The move could come as cases in 
Tokyo jumped over the weekend to top 1,000. Media reports say this declaration would cover the capital as well as possibly the Osaka area. Joining us now is Eric Lonigan, fund manager at M&G. Eric, great to have you with us on the show. So we see some green on the screen for global equities today. What strategy would you be taking around equity markets from here? I'm pretty pretty constructive on equity markets <clears throat> from here, um, largely because you know the, 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 ultimately the dynamics here of, of of the virus and the economy are are very very complex. But there are certain relatively simple observations one can one can take from the history of stock markets. Um, and what we do know from the history of stock markets is that buying the stock market in recession has tended to be one of the highest returning strategies. So if you think of it very simplistically, the way I, I, I would sort of interpret events currently or think about investing in the current environment is if you made a very conservative assumption, which is that earnings return to where they were pre-corona on an 18-month view, which is a very conservative view, I would say, and we return to similar P multiples for the MSCI world, which, again, the world equity markets were not particularly stretched coming into this. You can argue about different geographies, but at the aggregate, they weren't. You know, you're looking, depending on the geography, of anywhere between 30 and 50 percent returns on a 12-, on 18-month a view. So I think a lot of this is about time horizon. You know, when you have recessions, when you have crises or emergencies, which is what this is, um, people's time horizons tend to collapse. We find it very difficult to see beyond a week, let alone two weeks. You know, we're all tracking data on a daily basis. But if you try and sort of exercise kind of emotional time travel and, and think to yourself how when I look back on this in 12 or 18 months time, what will the right investment decision to have made? Um, I think it's pretty compelling that you'll want to have been been buying equities. And you do say in your notes, good morning to you, Eric, you say that we suffer from extreme morning, myopia, much. volatility, aversion, and a collapse in our time horizons. Maybe that's the safe trade. Um, can I ask you how to differentiate the opportunity? You say now has never been, uh, you look at the markets, it's rarely been a better time to buy equities. I look at what Scott Maynard is saying this morning, emerging markets could be the next domino to fall because of debt. As you look at the world, Eric, yeah. where is the best opportunity at this moment in time, given that there's a, a small yeah. light at the end of the tunnel, as one of our, one of our regular guests says? Well, I, I, absolutely. So, so my own preference is to be buying broad equity indices. And there's a very good reason for that. I mean, so, for example, if the, the, the kind of the, the cost of what's happening here is pretty clear to all of us, which is they're going to this is a huge economic shock to households and, and to certain businesses and certain sectors. You know, as we all know, there are certain sectors that have seen 100 percent drops in revenues. We don't quite know for how long, whether that's going to be two months, whether that's going to be three, four months. Um, and, and, and many businesses are unlikely to survive. The advantage of buying the aggregate mm. equity index is you get exposure to the winners and the losers. I mean, the reality in any recession is that weaker participants are going to struggle. They may not survive. Stronger businesses will ultimately thrive and take market share. So ironically, I actually think the equity market is the least risky investment. The problem with government bonds here, and we should come back to this, I think it's pretty clear now that we have seen the lows in yield, and we can talk about that. I think it's particularly striking when you look at Europe. Um, if you look at credit, you have to be very, very careful because default risk yep. is rightly very elevated, whereas equities actually give you a very high degree of diversification if you buy broad equity indices. Yeah, and on credit, Eric, um, you know, you could um, ask yourself whether there's a real bifurcation that's going to come in credit, whereas previously it seemed as if the tide was lifting all boats. Um, I wonder which parts of credit you see opportunities in. Some investors have said, buy whatever the Fed's buying. Mohamed el says you should be cautious on investment-grade U.S. credit, even though the Fed is poised to begin buying it because there's fallen angel risk. Where do you see the opportunities in credit? Well, my concern with credit is that, you know, I, I, I've been studying economies for, you know, longer than I should have been. You know, I remember the, the, the Asian crisis, the emerging market crisis, places like Argentina, 
you know, I've studied history. I've studied the, the early 70s, the oil crisis. You know, I've never seen anything like this. The severity of this recession is unprecedented. Um, admittedly, it has some unusual characteristics because its kind of duration is almost determined, you know, by, by the calendar. Um, and in some sense, it's a kind of voluntary recession in a strange way. But, that, but that, that doesn't underestimate the significance of its severity. So I think it's very difficult to model default risk in this environment. Um, again, my, my preference would be to go to aggregate indices, at least you know, to, to, in, in favor of credit. We've seen some really quite extreme moves in spread. Eric, so your odds are reasonable. We have indeed, but I, I think Eric. And, and equity, just on, on, on that, and we will, we will come back. To, to the broader topic in terms of the risks associated with, with digging yeah. deep into credit. Allianz, there's a lovely story this morning. They say that they're hoovering up cheap amounts of credit, that the issuance that we saw last week, $200 billion of issuance, many of it was priced almost at single B levels. Which areas of credit would you be prone or tempted to buy? We'll talk about the cautionary side later, but where are you tempted in yeah. to buy right now? Well, I think, you know, some of the broad CDS indices, you know, I, I, I tend to invest in the most liquid parts of the market. I wouldn't try to be too, too cute sectorally. I think it's too risky. So I've looked at things, things like the iTrax crossover. I, I, I've, I've started to, to purchase some of those broader indices. Things like long-dated triple Bs, um, where you've seen spreads widen quite materially. Those are the businesses with the strongest balance sheets. Uh, those areas are attractive, but but you know if I compare my my expected return risk adjusted to compared to buying the DAX, you know you think this is the German capital stock peak to trough, you know it's down about forty percent. You've had a huge discount in the price of the German capital base, the German economy. You look at the you know we've already seen the fiscal resources that the state has. I think if you extend your time horizon, risk adjusted, uh, those are much more interesting opportunities. Eric Lonergan from MNG stays with us. Look forward to the rest of our conversations through the hour. But for now, let's get to the first word news. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been taken to hospital for tests. That's as he struggles to shake the symptoms of coronavirus after being in self-isolation for 10 days. Downing Street says the step is a precaution and he remains in charge of the government. The UK currently has nearly 50,000 cases. The British government is warning the lockdown could be tightened if the public defy the rules. Health Secretary Matt Hancock has criticised people ignoring social distancing and gathering or sunbathing in parks. Meanwhile, Queen Elizabeth II has urged Britons to adopt the same discipline and resolve that got the UK through World War II. I hope in the years to come, everyone will be able to take pride in how they responded to this challenge. And those who come after us will say the Britons of this generation were as strong as any. And Keir Starmer has been elected leader of the UK Labour Party. He's a political moderate, replacing the more left-wing Jeremy Corbyn. He wasted little time in criticising successive Conservative governments over austerity and the damage done to the National Health Service. But he promised to work constructively with the current government in tackling the outbreak. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and at Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries, Manus. Coming up, German Finance Minister Olaf Scholz called for a quick financial stabilization of European countries hit by the coronavirus while avoiding any mention of joint debt issuance. We cover the story on Bloomberg.
Melinda Gates, thank you so much for joining us on Bloomberg Studio 1.0. Who shaped my views were the women I talked to. I think Facebook's how we won in a lot of ways. Running Microsoft was a ton of fun, and it was, you know, it's kind of inspirational. This is your weekly review of the most important business news and interviews from Bloomberg Television around the world. Even in a circumstance where you're down 80% of the rest of the year, we're still going to have $4 billion of cash. Uh, we're going to have access to a $2 billion revolver. We think it's highly, highly, highly unlikely, but we are planning for the worst case. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Manish Kranny in Dubai with Nir Chaich in London to the markets. Uh, we've got Asian stocks, U.S. equity futures all climbing this morning. There's relief. The data shows a shift in Italy, in Spain, in the United States of America. Mike Wilson, Morgan Stanley says forced liquidation of assets has passed. Uh, and J.P. Morgan says a floor has been established in these markets as the data begins to look a little bit more helpful. Oh, that is all based on global close down. To the bond market, there'll be quite a bit of issuance this week from the bond market. You're gonna see uh, three-year paper, $40 billion worth of paper coming to the market there. Uh, so 10-year yields on the move. Our guest host says that we've seen the low in yields. Japan is about to declare a state of emergency in Tokyo. What does that mean for stimulus and oil? Can they do a global deal? Those are the issues now that we've got to talk about because it is a slagging match between Saudi, Russia and the US on oil. Absolutely. And in some ways, they have been maybe not slanging matches, but certainly disagreements in Europe. So let's turn to Europe. The European countries worst hit by the coronavirus have reported falling death rates, with Italy saying the worst may be over. Latest figures suggest tight restrictions on public movement are having a positive effect. Between them, Italy and Spain have the most infections in Europe. But the Public Health Institute in Rome says it's seeing a significant slowdown in the spread. And German Finance Minister Olaf Scholz called for the quick financial stabilization of European countries hit by the coronavirus while avoiding any mention of joint debt issuance. He said the European Stability Mechanism Rescue Fund already now offers the possibility for Euro countries to raise capital jointly with the same advantageous terms for all manners. Well, in the UK now, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson is in hospital for coronavirus tests. After suffering the effects and remaining in self-isolation, for 10 days. Downing Street says it's a precaution and he remains in charge of government. The UK consumer, however, confidence the sharpest fall there on record as Britons adjust to the reality of coronavirus lockdown. GFK said its measures of sentiment dropped 25 points to negative 34 between the middle of March and the end of the month, close to the nadir seen during the financial crisis more than a decade ago. Eric Lonergan is our guest host this morning. He joins Nera and I down the line. Eric, thank you very much from m g for being with us. I take you to the op-ed from you, the German uh, minister this morning, finance minister this morning. Um, he's really sort of saying, look, if you need to draw on anything, draw on the ESM to his neighbors in Italy and Spain. Um, whereas there is these rallying calls for coronavirus bonds. Let's deal with the ESM yeah. first of all. In terms of the scale of what might be available through the ESM, is it big enough? When they talk about monetizing the ESM, they're talking about 2% of GDP. First of all, your take on that. No, I mean, <clears throat> I think my, my sense here is, you, you know, one's got to, again, always stand back in, in the context of the Eurozone and simply acknowledge what's been a, a kind of governing principle for the last decade which is Germany gave up monetary sovereignty um, through the European Central Bank. The Bundesbank has been overruled on every single big monetary policy decision, pretty much. Germany is not going to give up fiscal sovereignty. And so we just, we just know that there is not going to be a situation where other countries can effectively borrow against Germany's balance sheet, either directly or indirectly. So I think the model has to be a combination of 
monetary policy capping yields and effectively sovereign or national decisions. So you know, part of the reason, I, in a sense, I don't understand tactically why people try to bring up this issue of, of, of the issuance of eurobonds, because it's just not going to happen. So it would make more sense to me, given that the budget rule has been suspended, actually for in a sense, for there to be an allegiance of countries, Spain and Italy should say, let's just test the bond market and make it the ECB's problem. If anything, they should coordinate with the ECB. So I, I think this, the simplest solution in the Eurozone would actually be for the European Central Bank just to cap spreads. So if the ECB came out and said, we're actually going to take a, take a leap out of the book from the Bank of Japan, except we're going to target the spread, and we're going to say the gap between the lowest yield and the highest yield across European sovereigns is 50 basis points, and that's going to be the case for 12 months. That would just free sovereigns to do whatever they want. Right? They can just issue whatever is needed yeah. for their fiscal stimulus. I think the problem with trying to reinvent Eric, institutions yeah. in the middle of this crisis against these kind of political headwinds is just not going to happen. Fine. So if you think corona bonds aren't going to happen, Eric, would another potential alternative be a joint debt reduction fund? It's something that's been discussed before. Look, I, I think they've got the model. You know, well, let's say Italy decides to temporarily run a 15 percent of GDP budget deficit. What's the problem with that? It's only a problem if it puts pressure on BTP spreads. So there needs to be coordination. The, set, the, the ECB needs to come out and say... This is an emergency. The fiscal rules have been suspended. As far as we're concerned, governments can issue as much debt as they want to deal with this crisis. And we're going to cap spreads. To me, then, you, you resolve all the problems. Right? You've got limitless financial power. You leave it the decision-making to the national level, so you avoid all of the politics. And you deal with the crux of the matter. You know, the mm -hmm. only problem with Italy issuing debt is that spreads widen. Eric, can we deal with spreads um, between the U.S. And, and Europe? As you say, you would yeah. propagate uh, yield curve control is the way forward on the spread. So that would be your suggested solution. Citigroup would agree with you. They would say we're already in yield curve control territory. Yeah. But to the transatlantic spread, Bund's treasuries, we're seeing it roll over. My question to you is, if you believe that we've seen the bottom of U.S. spreads, and you do not believe that they will compress any further. What happens to the transatlantic spread between treasuries and bonds? Yeah. Is it driven more by ECB momentum? Well, Manus, be, before we address the issue of spreads, I want to point something out to you that I think is incredibly important. So one of the most interesting policy decisions, in my opinion, that hasn't really been paid much attention is actually an act of omission which is it is quite extraordinary that the European Central Bank did not cut interest rates during this crisis. So if you actually look at where 10-year bond yields are and 30-year bond yields, the yield is higher than it was in August last summer today. Now, if you can't make money in the bond market in a global pandemic, what does it take to make money in bonds? Yep, well, we'll come back to that subject in, in just a few <laughs> minutes, Eric. Thank you very much. Eric Lonergan stays with us as our guest host from MNG. Coming up on the show, it's a call for national lockdown. Billionaire voice Bill Gates gives us his views on the coronavirus as the U.S. works to avoid the worst-case scenario. This is Bloomberg.